Okay, great. It looks like we are at the top of the hour. So let's go ahead and get started. And others probably will be joining as we go along, which is great. Um, welcome everyone to the City of Hope Cancer Center and ACPMP Research Foundation webinar. So my name is Deborah Shelton and I'm the medical liaison at the ACPMP Research Foundation. The foundation's mission is twofold, uh, promising, we fund promising research um, to find a cure for appendix cancer, PMP, and related peritoneal malignancies. And we fund educational programs for physicians, healthcare professionals, uh, patients, and their caregivers um, to inform about these diseases. And that's really what brings us all here today. The ACPMP Research Foundation is pleased to have the privilege of having Dr. Rauf, a surgical oncologist and scientist from the City of Hope Cancer Center as our featured presenter. Dr. Rauf will be speaking with us about regional therapy for appendix cancer, past, present, and future. And in terms of the future aspect, I really want to highlight that Dr. Rauf is co-leading the first U.S. PIPAC clinical trial and runs the basic and translational lab focused on peritoneal malignancies. So it's really exciting to hear some of his insight forward-looking as well. So just a little more about Dr. Rauf. He received his medical degree from Pakistan's Aga Khan University. And then he came to the US where he continued his training at Harvard, Yale, MD Anderson Cancer Center and the University of Arizona. Dr. Rauf is the author of dozens of peer reviewed papers that have been published in leading scientific journals. And he's a recipient of numerous prestigious honors and awards. At the City of Hope Cancer Center, Dr. Rauf is part of one of the largest programs in the region performing complex cytoreductive surgery and heated intrapreneurial chemotherapy, in other words, CRS, HIPEC. Um, all of these cancers that Dr. Rauf uh, works on have disseminated within the abdominal cavity, but he also has vast experience in providing all aspects of surgical care in patients whose cancers have spread to the liver. What I really like, uh, and I think patients really appreciate about Dr. Rove, his mission is to deliver complex surgical oncology care with both expertise and compassion, as well as to develop new therapies for patients with gastrointestinal cancers. So we're very grateful, Dr. Rove, for your taking the time to join us. Let me just quickly um, hit on a couple of housekeeping measures. Dr. Rove is going to present to us for I think about 40 minutes or so. Then he has a YouTube video of the PIPAC procedure that he will show. And then following that, we're hoping to have time for at least a couple of questions. We'll certainly get to as many questions as we can um, as part of our final Q&A session. You, if you have questions during the, the talk, you can access those through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We also did receive some questions as part of the registration process. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and it will be available by YouTube, the YouTube channel, and also the ACPMP website. Um, final word, the, um, both Dr. Rove's presentation and the YouTube video do um, contain some graphic images and so just want to kind of call that out in case any of our attendees are sensitive to that, you might want to step away um, during those portions. Um, with that, I, it's way too much for me. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rove. And thank you again, Doctor, for your time tonight to speak with all of us. Thank you, Deborah, for that very kind introduction. It's a pleasure to talk to ACPMP uh, Research Foundation and discuss um, 
the progress we're making in improving care for patients with endothelial cancers. So I want to start with, you know, pointing out what peritoneum is, and a lot of you may be already familiar with this, but it's an often neglected organ because it does not um, appear like any of the other organs in the body. And so peritoneum is essentially the inner lining of the abdomen. I tell patients that if you imagine you're sitting in the room, the paint on the walls is the inner lining uh, of that room. And similarly, there's an inner lining of the abdomen that essentially takes uh, completely covers the uh, abdomen as well as um, different organs. And, and there are differences in where that peritoneum is. And I think that becomes important um, as we are trying to develop therapies because um, uh, it's important to understand what the host environment is for different types of cancers. So peritoneal surface malignancies can occur with many gastrointestinal cancers. Um, and when they are from the gastrointestinal tract, typically they're called carcinomatosis. And some of the common ones include colorectal, appendiceal, gastric, ovarian. Uh, there are other gyne and GI cancers as well. Um, mesotheliomas, which, uh, which start from the mesothelium um, of the inner lining can also generate cancers. And then there are other rare types of sarcomas that can involve uh, the inner lining. And in this picture, you can see how mesothelioma appears um, on the small intestine. So we're focusing on appendiceal in this talk. Um, I briefly would like to sort of mention the scope of the problem. This is often neglected in clinical trials and also an understudy topic. 10 to 50% of GI cancers will have carcinomatosis. It automatically, um, you know, um, uh, tells us that the patients will have uh, a less optimal prognosis whenever um, carcinomatosis is detected. And we've seen that in different cohorts of patients across disease sites that whenever there's carcinomatosis, with some exceptions, um, is generally a poor prognostic feature. So in 25 to 35% of patients, primary site of failure is actually uh, the peritoneum. Um, ovarian cancer has been the most studied in which peritoneum is the typical area that's involved and, um, and, and, and uh, the treatments have been advanced for ovarian cancer at a much more rapid pace than the GI cancer. So um, coming back to appendix cancer, um, as you guys know that uh, appendix cancer is rare. It's 0.4 to 1% of all GI cancers, about 1,500 cases per year in the US. 32% of patients actually present with appendicitis. Many others are detected on imaging done for other reasons. And sometimes it presents at a disseminated stage in about a third of patients where um, people are either going to have their hernia fixed and they're noted to have um, mucin within the bulge or they're uh, found to have ovarian tumors later um, uh, than understood to be from uh, coming from the appendix uh, upon proper staging. So at the time of presentation, uh, appendix cancer is localized in about 26% of patients. In another 20%, it has always it has already gone to the lymph nodes, but it may involve the peritoneum in up to 53% of patients. Um, we also see metastases to the liver and to the lung in a fraction of the patients. Um, the tumors may actually skip the liver and go directly to the lung. That's also very common. Uh, scenario that we see with distant organ metastases. This is a patient of mine that I treated approximately three years ago, and he's a 50-year-old gentleman who had an appendectomy for appendicitis, and the final pathology demonstrated a low-grade appendiceal neoplasm. And at that time, he was told that that was benign and no follow-up is needed, and subsequently he presented four years later with abdominal symptoms, most notably abdominal distension. And he was unfortunately asked to lose weight by the primary care physician. And it speaks, when, when disease is rare, it speaks to the, um, 
the lack of knowledge even within the medical community about a diagnosis like this. Ultimately, he got a CT scan about four months after initial presentation that demonstrated extensive mucinous neoplastic disease within the abdomen, pushing on different structures within the abdomen. We took this gentleman to the operating room for initially a palliative operation because at the time I met him, he was in significant distress. And so typically, as you can see the picture on, the, uh, on your uh, right, um, there is a, a, what we call a mental cake. So this tumor involves the omentum and there's a lot of mucin pockets, um, sort of like a, a, a cluster of mucin pockets in the omentum that essentially takes up a lot of the abdominal space and causes abdominal distension. This process happens over a period of time. So the discomfort is, is not as severe to prompt immediate medical attention. And you know, we basically, on the picture of the screen left, you will see that the, the peritoneal cavity has somewhat been dissected like an entire sac. And uh, that's typically our approach. We don't enter the abdominal cavity till much later and basically dissect the entire peritoneal cavity completely before we get in and start removing tumors. So in this case, um, you know, we address the areas um, of blockage, you know, to improve the quality of life and get this patient stronger with the goals of coming back for a complete cytoreduction reduction as a second stage operation. And this is after the first stage operation, you can see a lot of the mucin has been debulked, but there still remains quite a bit of disease. And we do this staged operation quite frequently to get patients who have extreme levels of disease to get them to an operation uh, to complete cytoreduction reduction later. So I wanna discuss uh, some of the pathologic features of appendiceal cancers. So typically um, when somebody gets a pathology report, these are the terms that show up on the pathology report. So mucinous, non-mucinous, goblet cell type, and all of these three varieties of appendix cancer can also be signal ring cell type. Now there is a separate category of appendix cancer, which I'm not discussing today, and those are called neuroendocrine tumors. They arise from enterochromaffin cells, a different type of cell type. These uh, tumors uh, behave much differently than the typical uh, garden variety appendix cancer. The classification of appendix cancer has been um, a challenge and um, it has gone through several nomenclatures over the previous uh, three to four decades. And um, I think, you know, that at this point there is increased consensus with the most recent classification. And given that we have not agreed over the years on, on a central classification system up until 2009 has significantly uh, impacted uh, progress towards um, uh, identifying treatment uh, options. And so this is the diagram of an inner lining of the appendix. So I, number one is normal. So you can see how the cells that are lining the appendix are pretty normal looking and they're well behaved, um, arranged in a single row. Um, at some point, the appendix cells start growing, overgrowing and because of limited space, they form these polyp-like structures and this is called hyperplasia. The cancerous changes start happening when there are mutations acquired within the DNA of these cells and they became they, they are then termed dysplastic and they are rogue appearing cells, but still somewhat well behaved in that they have not broken through the barrier um, that curtails or that limits uh, the growth of those cells. And in the last picture, you can see the cells in red are breaking through that barrier, and that's when we call it invasive cancer. The pathologists try to label these cancers in, in different ways. And so they look at the architecture of the cells, and is it normal architecture? Is it complex architecture? Meaning it's breaking the barriers or not respecting the normal boundaries of the tissue. They also look at what is called grade. So grade is based on how the, the components within the cell appear. So for example, the circles within the cell is, are the nuclei or the nucleus. So it's a separate compartment 
uh, the largest compartment within the cell. And when it takes different shapes and sizes, you know, it, it, it deviates from the normal and that's what is called high grade cytology. So based on what the cytology and the architecture is, it's classified as a neoplasm, either a low grade neoplasm or a high grade neoplasm if the architecture is simple. But when it starts showing invasion, it's then termed adenocarcinoma. And then you can call it low grade, moderate or high grade, depending on how aggressive it looks. When the, when the cells are neoplastic, they can make a lot of mucin. So mucin is normally produced um, by the GI tract um, to allow uh, movement of food through the gastrointestinal tract. But when there's hyperplastic epithelium, it can generate um, abnormal levels of mucin, which can lead to the appendix rupturing. So you, you can see the, the picture on the screen left, the mucosal has ruptured and, and the mucin is escaping. And along with that, the inner lining that is producing that mucin can escape. And that's the pathophysiology of what is called low-grade appendiceal neoplasm. But then there is other type, which could be a high-grade adenocarcinoma, you know, which shows invasion without significant mucin production. And that can, that can escape the appendix directly by extending through the abdominal wall into the rest, of, through the appendiceal wall into the rest of the abdominal cavity. And then there, we see also a phenotype, um, a variety in which both processes are happening. So when invasion is happening, those are generally more aggressive and they spread by mucosal rupture, those are less aggressive. So here are some pictures of what pathology looks like and, and to an untrained eye on the left side, you can see that there is um, still some organization and some lining up of the cells on, on what we call basement membrane. They're lined up really nicely, but then the nuclei are a little bit haphazard. So that's that's a low-grade pathology. And on the, on the screen right, you can see the cells are you know, more uh, heterogeneous. They look much different. Some are, some are smaller, some are larger. There are prominent dots in the center. Those are compartments within the nucleus called nucleoli. And when they're prominent like that, it also signifies that these are high-grade cells. When you go at a lower power magnification and you see how it's invading into the tissue, um, you realize that even though it appears that these cells are invading into the tissue, they're actually not invading. They're, they're extending by compression on that tissue. And just like if you were to put a put a wire over an ice block and hang weight on either sides and you let that wire put exert pressure on the ice, the wire cuts through the ice block. Similarly, this tissue can exert pressure onto the normal structure and without invasion actually get through to the other side. And to an untrained pathologist who doesn't see a lot of these, you know, this is an extremely challenging um, a distinction to make, make whether the glands are invasive or not. And so one thing I would like to emphasize is that, you know, it, uh, an appendiceal cancer pathology should be reviewed uh, with pathologists who are trained at looking at this, who see a lot of this. And it's just pattern recognition. It's not that those pathologists who are not seeing much of it are not good. They're good in their own right, except that, you know, they don't see a lot of it to recognize the different patterns. And so here again, uh, panel five is a, is a figure where you can see the normal wall of the appendix is attenuated. And you know the normal wall typically has muscle in it. And over here, it's sort of pressed and scarred down and ultimately this area will rupture. And panel six shows when it has disseminated into the abdomen, you can see the inner lining and you can see the mucin production um, around it. You know, all this uh, light pink areas are mucin production with some some um, cells uh, that are from the connective tissue around it. And these dark purple lines are the uh, epithelium. So this is low grade histology. So when you look at high grade histology, you can see how ugly these cells look and they look aggressive and nasty, just looking at the pictures and, and they can also take different, um, different patterns. So here they call form growth. Sometimes there's a report mentions that there are signet ring cells and these are, you know, they, they look like rings, you know, um, these cells have mucin within them and they take this form where the nucleus of the cell is pushed to the side. And this is what is called signet ring cell. 
And typically, signaled ring cells are associated with a worse prognosis. They're more regressive cancers. Um, and it's not unique to appendix cancer. It can happen in other GI cancers too. Um, the signaled ring cells can be floating type or invading type. And generally, the floating type tend to be a little bit better than the invading type. So there are nuances involved in, in even, even you know, subtyping or subclassification of these appendix tumors. Now, this is a little bit complicated slide, but I want to highlight a point here that we've had several classification schemes that people have used to classify these tumors. And even for expert pathologists, this, is, this can be uh, a challenging diagnosis and is a subject of tumor board discussion um, uh, on a weekly basis. So you can see you have a, a RONIT classification that was you know, in early 80s and 90s and then from 90s to early 2000s, people were using Ronit and Bradley classification. And now since 2009, there's the Mistragic classification, which has been now adopted as the WHO classification. So you have low-grade mucinous neoplasm. There are three categories. There's a low-grade mucinous neoplasm. There is the adenocarcinoma that's well differentiated. And then there's the adenocarcinoma that is high grade. And the treatment really depends on the on the bucket the patient falls in. However, I would like to say that the reason that it is so challenging is because this is the disease spectrum. So many patients fall in between these categories. And so sometimes we have to make decisions taking it, uh, that fact into account. What we know is that grade is really a good indicator of how well the patients will do. And this is what they call a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. And on the left side, you can see the probability of somebody surviving. So the curve that is towards the ceiling has a better survival, and the curve that's towards the floor has a worse survival. And you can see the low-grade tumors do best, the, the moderate-grade tumors do intermediate, and the, the, the poor-grade uh, tumors or high-grade tumors do the worst out of the three. And this is uh, data from, from many, many cancer centers um, uh, part of the National Cancer Database. This has borne out in other studies as well. And so in over here, these are patients who've undergone surgery to remove all of their tumor. And you can see that in those patients, grade one, grade two, and grade three, um, you know, or in other words, PMP1, PMP2, or PMP3, those are different names for the same phenomena, those three classifications that I mentioned, they tend to have different prognosis. Can we improve on that? And this is some, something where the field is headed. You know, um, the Wake Forest group under Dr. Levine's guidance analyzed their tissues. And, and in those tissues, they wanted to distinguish the low-grade pathology and, and see if they could separate the low-grade pathology further. In, 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 and this is based in the notion we see all the time that there are some patients with low-grade tumors that do exceptionally well. And after cytoreduction and HIPEC, they may be cured, but then there are other patients that, that don't do as well. And even though their pathology looks exactly the same. So this is looking at the transcript level. So the DNA within the cell encodes multiple genes, um, uh, multiple proteins, and that protein, that message from the DNA to make the protein is taken by a molecule called the RNA. So in this case, they profiled those RNAs and looked at whether or not they were high or low in different tumor types. And in this case, you can see just by looking at it, you don't have to you know, focus exactly on what it shows, but just by looking at it, you can see the panel over here is different from the panel in the center, which is different from the panel on the left. And so the left two panels, cluster one and, and two, are both appendiceal cancers, but Cluster one is a low risk appendiceal cancer that has better survival. And cluster two is a higher risk appendiceal cancer that is worse survival. And then they compared it to the colorectal cancer patients. And it drives home the point that appendix cancer is not colorectal cancer. And because appendix cancer is rare, still to this date, you know, we treat it like colorectal cancer because that's the closest organ to which it is associated with. And, and a lot of the data for, for the treatment comes is extrapolated from colorectal cancer. But this brings 
this highlights the point very nicely that colorectal cancers are not appendiceal cancers. And there is some room to improve our ability to tell which patients do better versus uh, worse um, by looking at their molecular profiles. Why is that important? That particular question is because if we are able to classify patients who are, who are doing better with, with surgery and those who are not, we may be able to uh, plan additional therapy or different kinds of therapy for, for patients who are not doing as well and improve their outcome as well. So this is, you know, the first move towards making progress is to, is to, is to be able to prognosticate better. And here they show similar survival curves that these, these clusters have differing survival. And, uh, and, and, and these, this molecular signature has to be validated in prospective studies um, before it can be uh, used in the clinic uh, on a routine basis. Here they identify some genes that are important in, in, in these clusters. And, and again, you know, they provide some, some um, uh, paths forward in terms of research to, to develop better therapies. So what does the mutation profile look like? You know, um, over the last five to six years, there has been an explosion in, in genomic testing. And what I mean by that is, you know, the tumor uh, DNA can be taken and sequenced to identify what are the different mutations within, within uh, the DNA. So this is different from the data that I just showed you, which is transcriptome, which is the messenger RNA. So in this particular case, a, a, a particularly common uh, test that is used is foundation one testing. And in that foundation one testing, there are uh, many of the cancer-related genes are included within that panel. Not all the cancer genes, not all the genes in the in the in the human genome are included, but it's sort of like an enriched um, enriched uh, uh, panel. So, so the authors. This is a study from UCSD um, by our colleagues, and they basically um, looked at appendiceal cancers, and this is their histologic classification. Uh, mucinous adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma, um, not otherwise specified, goblet cell carcinoid, which is goblet cell adenocarcinoma, and pseudomyxoma peritonei is probably low-grade mucinous neoplasm, but this is, you know, as I mentioned, the class of histologic classification has been challenging, so they're not always appropriately labeled still to this day, and then signal brain cell carcinoma. In pseudomyxoma peritonei, KRAS and GNAS mutations are, are, are common, and GNAS is a very characteristic mutation in a low-grade mucinous neoplasm. And when you start having this P53 mutations, um, these mutations um, are associated with invasive pathology. And you can see that as you come towards signet ring cell, the GNAS mutations tend to fade away, whereas the KRAS and P53 mutations persist. And GNAS mutations are associated with mucinous histology. That link is also true for some of the other cancers, for example, pancreatic cancer um, that arises in a mucinous cyst. And the link between GNAS mutation and mucin production remains to be seen and investigated in, in, in studies. When you when you look at the profile of these mutations, you can see that by histology, there is a variable profile. And you can deduce from this that some of these mutations lead to differing pathway alterations. And you know these pathways are mentioned here. BRAS-RAF is a common cancer pathway. Uh, homologous recombination deficiency is a separate pathway in DNA repair. And PI3 kinase is also a cell signaling pathway. So when you compare it to other cancers, for example, pancreatic cancer and colorectal cancer, you know, you can see that there is some variation in terms of different genes that are mutated, but a lot of the genes are, are known entities within the GI cancers. And um, some of the markers we look at in terms of whether or not these cancers have um, the ability to respond to immunotherapy, for example, do they carry a lot of mutations? You can see the appendix cancers fall on the lower end of the spectrum. Very few appendix cancers will have um, high mutation burdens. 
uh, or you know microsatellite instability, which are biomarkers for response to immunotherapy. So in summary, when you when you look at the mutation profile, if you have if you have p53 mutation, um, it is associated with bad prognosis. If you have GNAS mutation alone, it's associated with better prognosis. But if you have both, it's intermediate prognosis. And that's better than the typical classification of high versus low grade uh, cancers that we've used um, uh, and continue to use at this point. So this is another study um, that looked at these molecular signatures and whether or not they are ready for prime time. And they find similar observations that I mentioned uh, in the prior two publications. But here I wanna focus on markers that would tell you if a cancer is responsive to immunotherapy or not. And they compare the appendix cancer to colorectal cancers. Um, and right-sided colorectal cancers are different from left-sided colorectal cancers. And, and you can see the appendix cancer numbers are pretty low, but still it's valuable to do this comparison. And in this slide, um, on the bottom line over here, we're looking at some of the markers that are associated with immune therapy response. So microsatellite instability, the higher the bar, the higher the chance it will respond to immune therapy, same with tumor mutation burden, same with PDL one and, and the beige bars here represent appendix cancer, the white bars are right-sided colorectal cancer, and left bar is, and the black bar is left-sided colorectal cancer. And you can see compared to right-sided colorectal cancer, the beige bars are all low, you know, compared to the colorectal cancer, suggesting that they don't have the signals that would mean that these cancers respond to immune therapy. So in terms of how we treat appendiceal cancer, um, I want to summarize our, our um, treatment paradigm um, at this point. So if it's a low-grade neoplasm, surgery typically involves appendectomy, and that's curative if it hasn't ruptured and spread to the inner lining. And no other surgery is needed, just follow-up is needed. If it has ruptured and on pathology, there is, um, there is spread of uh, neoplasm to the inner lining, then our goal is to remove all of the disease and do HIPEC, uh, which is heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. If, however, there is adenocarcinoma, which is the invasive cancer, the treatment recommendation is to do right colon resection because up to 20% of patients will have lymph node metastases and we want to be able to get those out. And also that's important for staging purposes. There are some exceptions uh, to that rule. After the tumor has been removed, is there any other therapy that is needed for a low-grade neoplasm or low-grade adenocarcinoma? There's no adjuvant chemotherapy that is typically recommended because these patients um, will have um, very low chance of response to chemotherapy. However, if the, if the adenocarcinoma it goes to the lymph nodes, then in that case, adjuvant chemotherapy is recommended. And that's based on data from colorectal cancer where adjuvant chemotherapy or chemotherapy after surgery is shown to improve survival. So we borrow that data and extrapolate it to appendiceal cancers. Now, when it goes to peritoneum, Typically, these are our tools. So cytoreductive surgery, meaning cutting out all the disease that is visible. That's probably the main treatment and you know the most effective. And then we combine it with doing chemotherapy, which kills the cancer cells that we don't see with our eyes. And when you combine it with heat, it, it improves the effect of the chemotherapy by inhibiting the DNA repair mechanisms. And chemotherapy damages the DNA if the cell can repair the DNA, then it can survive. But if you give heat, you, you inhibit the DNA repair as well and it increase the effectiveness of chemotherapy. So this is a, a study from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering a um, long time ago in 1992, where they were looking at um, uh, whether or not chemotherapy uh, addition improves survival after surgery. And you can see that they used a 5-FU chemotherapy and um, you know, there was no significant difference between the two survival curves, even though it's a small study. 
you know, um, it doesn't suggest that chemotherapy improves the survival um, after surgery. So during this time, there was increased interest in giving chemotherapy within the abdominal cavity. And um, what we learned was that um, during peritoneal, even within the peritoneal cavity, it doesn't get absorbed as readily within the abdominal cavity, within the um, intravenous compartment. It doesn't go to other organs. And so, so that is exciting because then we can limit the toxicity of these agents. And, um, and after this rationale was published, there were, were some clinical studies from um, Joe Fortner of heat in the abdominal cavity. You could perhaps improve the outcome of these animals. And then this is the first report of doing HIPEC um, for a patient, um, uh, you know, where they use methotrexate, which we don't use right, uh, at this point. And they demonstrated the proof of concept that the concentration within the perfusate was several log orders higher than what was experienced by the blood and the rest of the organs, and, and, and that this could be a viable strategy. And then Dr. Sugarbaker published experience with about 130 appendiceal cancer patients and 51 colorectal cancer patients. Um, this was the largest experience in 1995, and he demonstrated that in these patients, um, you could have a really good survival. So the top line is appendix cancer and the bottom line is colon cancer. And, um, and in this series, many patients were potentially cured from, from their disease with appendix cancer. And he showed that if you do a complete removal, that is the most important thing. And if the tumor is not completely removed, the patients don't do as well and the disease progresses. It doesn't come without complications. It's a big operation. And because of that, there was a very high fistula rate, which is 26% in normal GI surgery. This rate is less than 5%. And there were some anastomotic leaks, meaning the connections that were put together leaked. And so there were some concerns and three patients died within this cohort. And we've come a long way and the cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC has gotten much and uh, much more um, safer, and uh, a lot of it has to do with how we select patients. And this is um, a slide demonstrating that there are several agents that, that tend to stay within the peritoneal cavity and are ideally suited for intraperitoneal chemotherapy um, uh, based on the pharmacokinetic studies. We are able to score how much disease each patient has. That's another prognostic feature, the higher this peritoneal carcinomatosis index, um, the, the worse the patient's prognosis. And so along with grade, completeness of cytoreduction, um, the peritoneal carcinomatosis index is really important. So after the surgery is complete, we, we, we annotate how much disease is remaining by by the amount of tumor burden that remains. And ideally we want to be either CC0 or CC1. We know that patients with CC2 and CC3 cytoreduction generally don't have as good of a prognosis. So in cytoreduction, what do we actually do? We remove all parietal peritoneum, which is the lining um, underneath the muscle. We remove all of the visceral peritoneum, which is lining over the over uh, the organs, um, wherever it's feasible. And sometimes it's not possible to remove that lining. For example, on the small intestine, then we have to remove a portion of the bowel or remove um, uh, pieces um, uh, of the tumor and repair the intestine, wherever that is indicated. So here uh, is a slide demonstrating how the inner lining is removed from the left diaphragm. And this is what it would look like after you can see the muscle underneath. Um, and it's all of the tumor has been removed in this case. And this is a diagram of the pelvis. And you can see how the blood vessels are nicely displayed and all of the tumor has been removed along with the inner lining. And after that's done, two cannulas are placed and uh, the hot chemotherapy is circulated. This is a closed technique and you can also do an open technique, which is how Dr. Sugarbaker described it originally. Either way, the idea is to give the hot chemotherapy bath. Both techniques appear to be equivalent. And this is a hot chemotherapy pump that's circulating the chemotherapy. 
you do that for variable amount of time. Our standard is to do 90 minutes with mitomycin C. Now, when patients have high-grade disease, um, it, it's a significant challenge because those patients demonstrate the worst survival and typically are treated with IV chemotherapy up front to figure out the patients who have disease stability and might benefit from a large operation that I mentioned uh, just now. And so typically, as you can see, patients who have high-grade disease have a median survival of 6.9 months, um, uh, progression-free, and within seven months, the disease will progress on chemotherapy and overall survival is a little less than two years. And that's with cytoreductive surgery. So what is next for regional therapy? I think there are multiple other opportunities. We talked about cytoreductive surgery, um, HIPEC, but then currently we are developing other therapies that include cellular therapies. These could be immune cells that target the tumor and you know, for instance, uh, you may have heard of CAR T cells. Uh, these are engineered T cells that we are looking to deploy in the peritoneum against specific targets. There are um, viral therapy production. These oncolytic viruses, they go specifically to cancer cells and destroy the cancer cells as they divide, and they don't hurt the normal cells, and, and there are improvements in this area. Some nanotherapies where you can load the drug in the nanoparticle and deliver it have different ways to release the drug in a controlled fashion. And then there are also biologics, which could be antibodies that are uh, conjugated or connected to a toxin. The antibodies target cancer cells and deliver the toxin in a, in a very specific manner. So there are all these things that are under development and it may take a few years for these uh, to show in the clinical trials. Some of them have been tested in clinical trials with variable efficacy. Um, we are also looking to improve the ways of how chemotherapy is delivered. Not everybody's candidate for the cytoreductive surgery for patients who don't have disease that can be removed with surgery. Um, a novel way to deliver chemotherapy is PIPEC, which is pressurized intra-abdominal chemotherapy. And this is done with a laparoscopy and there will be a video that uh, we will show you to demonstrate how that's exactly done. And the whole idea behind PIPEC is to be able to control the disease when, when IV chemotherapy is toxic um, and uh, improve on, on IV chemotherapy, perhaps use it in combination to get more uh, effect. So coming back to the patient that I mentioned, this is the challenge we face. So uh, when I took him back, um, he got much stronger um, uh, and, and we waited about a year for him to uh, get strong enough for a second operation. When I took him to the operating room, I learned that you know he had extensive involvement of the rest of his abdomen in, in a way that the mucin and the scar and the tumor was uh, not surgically removable. You can see on the top, it, where the liver is supposed to be, you can see it's completely coated. All the organs are completely coated with tumor. And that's something that we weren't able to do much, um, uh, much with. And so, so when we look at pathology from this second surgery, you can see the, even though there is that GNAS mutation and the KRAS mutation that I mentioned, the P53 was not altered. So it's not invasive pathology. However, when you look at the pathology, it appears to be moving towards a well-differentiated adenocarcinoma spectrum. So even when they are not invasive pathology, we should not make any mistake that these are life-threatening tumors in many patients. So what I want to conclude from that is the number one, appendiceal cancers are not colorectal cancers, and it's about time that you know, we need to distinguish that in our clinical trials as well as our ongoing treatments um, and learn a, a great deal about appendiceal cancers um, in that they're separate from colon cancer. The histologic subtypes that we use currently, they do mirror molecular subtypes, but there is some avenue for improvement, uh, for improved prognostication and putting patients into different buckets so that we can appropriately triage them into the right types of clinical trials. Mucinous histology, um, this observation has panned out multiple times. It's associated with GNAS mutations. We need to understand why that is so that we can intercept. 
in some patients with appendiceal cancers, cure is possible. And Dr. Sugar Baker series as early as 1990s demonstrated that patients can have a really long-term survival if treated with surgery and high back at the appropriate time, um, even in a disseminated setting. And then we obviously need improved therapies for patients whose disease is unresectable or high grade. Um, the challenges in terms of the laboratory um, pro progress is that we don't have any genetically engineered models of appendiceal cancers. This has been the big challenge um, and um, a, a, an area of investigation. Uh, uh, there are groups uh, that are looking at organoid models to, to mimic what would be uh, in vivo, but I, I, I still strongly believe that animal models will be needed to make progress. We need to understand the biology of GNAS uh, protein. It's key to appendix cancer, especially the mucinous type. We need to understand the microenvironment, what immune cells are in the environment to make immunotherapy a reality for appendix cancer. We also need to understand the barriers to drug delivery, mucinous tumors, even um, present barriers to delivery within the intraperitoneal cavity. And uh, because it's such a rare tumor, precision oncology trials are challenging but not impossible. So uh, with that, I wanna conclude this part of the talk. Here's our team. On the top left, we are power posing after our first PIPEC trial patient enrollment. Um, you know, and uh, here's Dr. Dellinger and I operating. Um, you know, we're co-PIs on this PIPEC trial and it really is the great team I'm, I'm uh, showing. Um, the doctors, uh, my colleagues that are involved in this trial, but um, really it's a, it's a village that takes to get this trial going. We have enormous um, support from research staff, from our patients who are brave enough to enroll onto this trial. So I wanna thank them uh, publicly through this forum as well. And uh, with that, I'm gonna conclude this part and I'm gonna pass it on to um, Deborah to show the, the PIPEC video. Hello everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Today I will be discussing a phase one clinical trial being conducted at the City of Hope National Medical Center in Dormitay, California, looking at the safety and efficacy of pressurized intraperitoneal aerosolized chemotherapy or PIPEC in gynecologic, gastric, and colorectal cancer patients with peritoneal carcinomatosis. Unfortunately, the etiology of peritoneal carcinomatosis for the majority of our patients is metastatic dissemination of either ovarian gastric, or colorectal primary malignancies. While there is data to support the use of cytoreductive surgery, either with or without the addition of HIPEC, in the treatment of select patients with this disease process, not all patients are candidates for aggressive surgical debulking. For these patients, pressurized intraperitoneal aerosolized chemotherapy, or PIPEC, has emerged as an alternative method for intraperitoneal chemotherapy delivery with several advantages, including decreased morbidity, ease of delivery, and the minimally invasive nature, which allows for multiple administrations of intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Here is a schematic overview of the general principles of PIPEC. The essential components are gaining minimally invasive access to the perineal cavity to establish cabinoperitoneum, which is maintained at 12 millimeters of mercury. In addition, an automated injector containing the chemotherapeutic agent is connected to the micro pen using high pressure IV tubing with lure locks for secure attachment. The micro pen or nebulizer provided by Capnomed allows for precise atomization of the chemotherapy controlling for particle size. The air sliced chemotherapy is then allowed to circulate within the abdominal cavity for 30 minutes before being evacuated through a closed air sliced waste system. Shown here is the study schematic for the phase one clinical trial. Eligible patients must have histologically confirmed ovarian, uterine, gastric, appendiceal, or colorectal cancer with peritoneal metastases and must have progressed on at least one evidence-based chemotherapeutic regimen. Patients who meet inclusion criteria will fall into one of two arms. Arm one includes patients with gynecologic or gastric cancer will be treated with intraperitoneal administration of cisplatin and doxorubicin. Arm two includes patients with colorectal or appendiceal malignancies, and they will be treated with intravenous 5-FU and leucoborin, followed by intraperitoneal oxaliplatin. 
All of these patients will undergo PIPEC every six weeks for a total of three treatments while monitoring for dose limiting toxicity and any adverse events. There will be a follow-up period of one year looking at time to progression and progression free survival. By way of example, I will present the case of the first patient we enrolled in the study and highlight some practical and technical considerations for the administration of PIPEC. This is the case of 59 year old gentleman who was initially diagnosed with rectal adenocarcinoma in June of 2017. His metastatic workup was unremarkable and he received neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy followed by a robotic LAR. He went on to receive adjuvant consolidation chemotherapy and was ultimately placed on surveillance. Unfortunately, approximately two years from his surgery, surveillance imaging in September of 2019 found extensive perihepatic tumor deposits with significant omental and peritoneal disease. This was biopsied and shown to be metastatic mucinous adenocarcinoma. The patient, unfortunately, had mixed response to multiple lines of chemotherapy before being referred to the City of Hope for consideration of PIPEC. In preparation for the procedure, the operating room setup is modified to facilitate remote monitoring of the patient. The OR table is rotated 90 degrees counterclockwise to allow the anesthesiologist to remotely monitor the patient's airway and vitals from the substerile room. In addition, the automated injector is positioned within sight and the remote control unit is set up in the substerile room. Once the setup is complete, the patient is positioned supine on the operating table. We gain access to the reoperative abdomen as described by Glatz et al. using a cut down technique in the supra umbilical position. A 10 millimeter balloon trocar is used to create a tight seal between the trocar and the anterior abdominal wall to prevent any escape of the pneumoperitoneum or the aerosolized chemotherapy. Once we gain entry, the abdomen is surveyed and an additional 10 millimeter balloon port, which will later be used to house the capno pen, as well as a five millimeter accessory balloon port are then placed under direct visualization. A thorough examination of the abdomen is completed to assess the disease burden and calculate the PCI score. Abdominal ascites, if present, is documented and collected for cytology. Alternatively, peritoneal washings are collected, as shown here. As part of our protocol, tissue biopsies are collected both prior to and after the administration of PIPEC. As you can see here, these tissue samples will be analyzed for whole exome sequencing, spatial transcriptomics, and immune correlatives. In addition, serum samples will also be collected at various time points and analyzed for pharmacokinetics and germline sequencing. Once all the tissue samples have been collected, the initial abdominal access port is removed and the fascio and skin closure is completed and verified to be airtight. Here you can see the completed setup ready for PIPEC initiation. The capno pen is placed in the remaining 10 millimeter port, taking care to ensure no direct bowel contact. The high pressure tubing connecting the capno pen to the injector is draped in a sterile plastic. A self-retaining camera mount is used to secure the laparoscope and allow for remote video monitoring. Finally, the contained aerosol waste system is confirmed in position at the five millimeter camera port. During the entire process, a comprehensive checklist is utilized to ensure all safety measures have been appropriately taken. Once the setup is completed, all OR staff leave the room and the chemotherapy aerosolization is initiated remotely. The anesthesiologist continues to monitor the patient with appropriate PPE in case emergent reentry is necessary. Here we show an intraperitoneal view of the PIPEC. As the pressure in the system approaches a predetermined threshold, the chemotherapy is aerosolized as seen here. Once the chemotherapy is delivered, it is allowed to circulate in the abdomen for 30 minutes before being removed through the closed aerosolized waste system. Post PIPEC biopsies are taken and all ports are removed and closed. Postoperatively, 
patients are admitted overnight for observation. Serum study samples are collected at predetermined time points extending up to 24 hours post-procedure. Patients are continually monitored for any dose limiting toxicities or adverse events, and the majority of our patients are discharged home on postoperative day one. With that, I'd like to thank our study PIs, departmental leadership, and our additional participating sites. Okay, <clears throat> great. Thank you, Dr. Rowe, for the presentation and uh, for sharing that YouTube video with us. Um, I know I'm looking at the clock and I know we're supposed to end at six. We've got five minutes. Um, are you willing to make time for a couple of additional questions? Of course. Great. Happy Let's, to answer. In. Let's do it. Okay. Um, so on the pie pack, I have to tell you that we have so many patients that are, have been very interested in that. They hear about it outside the U.S. And now that you've got the clinical trial in the U.S., we get lots of questions. Can you just say a bit more about kind of the high-level differences between HIPAC and PIPAC, um, kind of advantages, disadvantages, and, and really, Dr. Rove, I think what would be most helpful is to help people understand what type of patient might be a good fit for the PIPAC clinical trial. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Um, so I would say, um, you know, the HIPAC and, and PIPAC are in, uh, you know, treating patients with two different types of diseases. So patients who are candidates for cytoreductive surgery and HIPAC should go ahead and get that treatment because the intent of that treatment is curative in many instances. So the, the cytoreductive surgery is removing all the tumor as I discussed and HIPAC is the hot chemotherapy given afterwards. Now in Europe, when, when the studies were done where they tried to combine PIPEC with cytoreductive surgery, they found prohibitive levels of side effects from chemotherapy given as PIPEC. And so we don't combine the cytoreductive surgery with PIPEC. So, so that leaves us to use PIPEC in, in cases where cytoreductive surgery is not feasible. And these are typically patients who have progressed on IV chemotherapy or who are not good candidates for IV chemotherapy or surgery and their disease is progressing. And so as far as eligibility is concerned, we wanna have enough space in the abdomen to give the, the aerosol chemotherapy. So patients who have a lot of mucin burden that completely takes over all the space in the abdomen, they're not going to be good candidates for that. Um, patients who have disease outside of the peritoneum, for example, lung and liver are not candidates for that because right now PIPEC treatment is not combined with systemic chemotherapy. And because PIPEC only treats the peritoneum or abdominal cavity, uh, those patients are excluded purposely from the clinical trial. Um, you know, PIPEC is essentially given in patients who, in, in summary, will not be candidates for cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC. Okay. Okay. Good. That's helpful. I think that'll be very helpful for patients. Um, and then the, you had a, a slide and a very nice um, portion of your talk on the kind of biological behavior of mucinous adenocarcinomas. And um, we got a question about the timeline I'm a lawyer by day, as you know, so you can give me the favorite lawyer response, which is, it depends. But do you have any thoughts ballpark on the timeline for how long it takes the appendix to create a mucinous cyst and then for the cyst to burst and spread throughout the peritoneal cavity? Yeah, so so it's very hard to determine that, you know, and, and I, I was going to say it depends, but it also, you know, the the knowledge is is not there because, you know, to be able to determine that, you we need some sort of a model to study. Um, there are some genomics approach through which you can establish that by how the DNA evolves over time, and people have used that for other cancers, but those studies have not been done for appendix cancer. Certainly, there's room for us to to answer that question. Um, 
you know, we know that even most aggressive GI cancers, for example, pancreatic cancer, um, you know, takes about eight years from the time a single cell undergoes DNA damage, oh, you know, yeah. and so, so likely these, these neoplasms and cancers don't hold, happen overnight. I think, you know, if I had to guess, it's probably months before, you know, the symptoms present. Um, we know that patients who have had the tumor in the inner lining, but was neglected for one reason or another, you know, it takes many, many years for them, you know, in case of a, a neoplasm, but if it's an adenocarcinoma, then it's, it could be months for them to progress and grow to a rapid, um, you know, amount of, uh, grow to a significant amount of disease burden. So, um, you know, for a mucinous cyst in the appendix, likely uh, years, you know. Oh. Okay, and then um, another question that we often get from patients and caregivers is about immunotherapies. So can you just briefly describe in your kind of, in your way of thinking, um, what, what is an immunotherapy? And, you know, is that something that could be helpful? We get a lot of patients asking, is this something to help for those with more aggressive pathologies that might not be eligible for CRS high pack? Like, yes. Is this so immunotherapy, yes. So immunotherapy is a, is a big revolution in oncology. And, uh, and starting 2010, you know, uh, we've, we've learned that um, certain immunotherapies can produce dramatic responses in patients who were otherwise considered incurable and, and had limited survival. Um, and so th this has produced significant excitement. You know, we continue to follow those patients as an oncology community and continue to learn about that. Um, there are some things that, that tells us if a patient will be a good candidate for immunotherapy. Um, and uh, patients' tumors that have high mutation burden or um, a marker on, on pathology or on genomic testing called microsatellite instability. Uh, those patients tend to respond well to um, a certain kind of immunotherapy. And, um, and so unfortunately, as I discussed in my, in my presentation, appendix cancer, you know, maybe 1% or less of appendix cancer patients will be eligible for that therapy that's even less than colorectal cancer, which could be up to 6%. And, uh, but it, for those 1% of patients, it could be, it could be a significant treatment. So, I, you know, I would encourage patients who have stage four disease to, to consider genomic testing to figure that out. Um, so immunotherapy in, 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 a, in a, a big picture is any treatment that boosts the immune response against the cancer. So um, there are many cells in the body that that develop mutations and have abnormal protein levels or abnormal proteins, um, those cells are cleared out by immune surveillance through your immune system. And, um, and somehow or the other, some, the cancer cells, when they develop into a tumor, they evade that immune system. So immune therapy in many ways is trying to um, uh, resurrect that immune system to fight that cancer again. and, and one of the pathways that through which the cancers evade the immune system was discovered uh, by Jim Allison and others, um, you know, for which a Nobel Prize was awarded recently. And so this is this is a significant breakthrough for us to be able to uh, activate the immune system in a way that it would eliminate tumors. I think for appendix cancer, that reality will take some time. I think it needs a little bit more work for us to understand how to make those what we call cold tumors, um, immunologically hot again, so that we could activate the immune system. As of now, uh, the indication uh, is for a drug called pembrolizumab in patients who have microsatellite unstable tumors. Did you say the bevacizumab or what was that drug? <laughs> pembrolizumab. Pembrolizumab. Okay. Pembrolizumab, P-E-M-B. Okay. Because we, we did have a question about, and I, I realize we're over time. So, but we did have a question. Somebody was asking, um, 
whether it makes sense to administer something like Avastin, Bevacizumab um, by itself after CRS high pack instead of with something like Folfox or Folfury. But I would assume that really depends on that specific patient and their situation and their physician's yeah. advice. I didn't know if you had any thoughts on that. I think single agent of Avastin is likely not going to have any activity. Um, a lot of the, so Avastin was thought to be um, anti-angiogenic, meaning it, it, it was designed to reduce the blood supply that the tumors make for their growth. Um, uh, the more we've learned about Avastin, you know, and other agents like that, they basically allow, they, the main mechanism is that they allow improved delivery of chemotherapy. So, so most oncologists would recommend that it be bared with some sort of um, chemotherapy. Okay. And I do not want us to wear out our welcome. I see we have two questions that have come in. One will take offline. Um, I just want the caregiver, I believe from Honduras to know that we did receive the question and we'll follow up with you um, for a good resource on identifying hospitals abroad and experts. We've got that information on the website. We'll follow up with you individually. Dr. Rauf, just one final question on PIPAC because that's such interest and you're, you're the one there with the clinical trials. So um, just for clarification on this question, would PIPAC make sense for someone who has already underdone CRS, undertaken CRS HIPAC and still has remaining disease? Is that, would this clinical trial be something that might make sense for them to explore? Or I think the question is really directed at does the CRS HIPAC kind of um, negate eligibility for that trial or otherwise not make sense? Yeah, that's a great question. So in our trial, um, you know, prior intraperitoneal therapy is allowed. And uh, so that means that if somebody's had site reduction in HIPAC and now their disease is progressing on chemotherapy, they would be eligible um, for PIPAC. Now, um, as I showed in the video, you need enough space for, for, you know, for it to be aerosolized and for us to do laparoscopy. And if somebody's had extensive cytoreductive surgery, usually the scar tissue will prohibit that. So these decisions are made on a case-by-case -case basis. If we are unsure, sometimes we, before enrolling on the PIPEC trial, we will uh, attempt a laparoscopy to ensure that we can actually get in the abdomen and, and create enough space um, for uh, PIPEC. Okay, so it sounds like it's possible, but fact specific, very individual specific, but Correct. not a definitive no. Correct. Okay, that's great. Um, that's great. I know that we are over time and I just wanna thank you again on behalf of ACPMP Research Foundation for taking the time to give us so much information and to answer some of our questions. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you, I appreciate the invitation. Okay, take care. Bye. Thank you all for attending. I, uh, this wraps this, this webinar up. Um, I hope that everyone has found it as beneficial as I certainly have. And um, I wish everyone a good evening. Thank you.